All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by repeat guest Darius Dale, who is, of course, the founder of 42 Macro. Darius, welcome back to the show. Mike, what's up, brother? How are you? Hey, I'm not as good as you. You just had uh, quite a week. Uh, I don't want to delve too far into it, but bachelor party, that's always always a big week. So uh, Dude, I'm uh, we'll, jealous. We'll say uh, what happens in Miami stays in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, guys? If you stay to the end of the episode, Darius has promised a couple Easter eggs. So uh, we'll hang that over your head. Look, look here for you. Um, let, let's get right into it, though, Darius. And uh, we were kind of just getting into a whole bunch of interesting stuff off camera. But maybe, uh, you know, one of my favorite parts about your your research is not only are you directionally correct most of the time, but you also have these kind of fun turns of phrase uh, that really paint a picture for people. And, you know, I want to actually kind of start with a jumping off point of your latest recommendation, which is don't be a hero. So so maybe let's use that and say, why is why is this not the time to be a hero? Yeah, so the, uh, the great question, right? And And so... Where that really stems from is, is our understanding of, of where we are in these broader cycles that really matter to asset markets. Uh, obviously, mm. the liquidity cycle, particularly for the cryptocurrency community, uh, is generally the most important cycle. But there are other cycles, the growth cycle, the inflation cycle, um, the broader credit cycle, which we have not really entered yet. Um, all these things remain ahead of us. And so what I mean by don't be a hero, which is, you know, you might see Bitcoin pumping or the Nasdaq pumping here and there, you know, various intervals. But to extrapolate that into the signs of a fresh bull market, in my opinion, is very dangerous, given that so many of these traditional business cycle processes have yet to play out. Yeah, Derek, you know, I love the way that you you phrase that. And, you know, mentally, sometimes I find myself when when I'm reading your work, I almost imagine these kind of like sign like these kind of waves, right? And each one of them kind of bump up against each other. And there's a general pattern, right, for how they typically go and in order. But sometimes they interact in funny ways, which can be confusing uh, to the average per, you know, market participant or viewer of markets. And I think that's what makes this period of time so difficult because it feels like we have so many different signals kind of bumping up and conflicting against each other. Is that is that about the size of it? Yeah, I would definitely say that. I mean, the number one signal on my screens, and I'm sure you guys would agree with as well, which is what appears to be this sort of inflection in, in the liquidity cycle. Uh, yeah. Obviously, if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, uh, it's grown pretty considerably uh, in recent weeks as a response to the, uh, the uptake in emergency lending vis-a-vis um, -vis the banking crisis. Um, and so if you look at, you know, sort of what we call 42 macro net liquidity, we've talked about this on the show before, but yeah. Fed balance sheet minus treasury general account minus reverse repo facility, that, that total has risen some around 300 billion in recent weeks. However, if you would subtract the emergency lending programs, which must be paid back and are collateralized, which means the money is not, you know, <laughs> floating around the financial sector like QE would be, um, you know, it, it really actually has not risen. And in fact, it's actually still continuing to trend lower. So I'd be very cautious uh, to your viewers about sort of extrapolating, you know, sort of, you know, some of these metrics that I even myself have made up into, you know, the fresh bull market for a lot of these risk assets. I think there's going to be, uh, quite frankly, a lot of pain ahead, particularly in the second half of the year and potentially even into the first part of 2024 once we get past repricing the very near term growth dynamics. Yeah. And I think this is probably a great way to just take this conversation. Let's let's just focus on the liquidity cycle for now. Um, could you help contextualize? Because, you know, oftentimes people are too simplistic online. Everyone has kind of seen those charts, right? Of like, hey, this is the Fed's balance sheet. We've seen this gigantic spike up. Over two thirds of quantitative tightening so far to this point has been reversed. What is the right way to interpret that data? Yeah. So the, well, the, I'll start by saying, in my opinion, the right way to interpret data, if you're dealing with your own hard-earned net wealth or the hard-earned net wealth of other people's families, is to not Occam's razor it, right? Like, If, if mm. it was easy to make money in financial markets just looking at a chart on Twitter, we'd all be billionaires, right? <laughs> it's very clearly not the case. And so, you know, the reality is it's a lot harder. You know, I spend most of my time interacting with institutional investors, you know, folks at hedge funds, mutual funds, et cetera. You know, we all understand that it's not as easy as it looks on Twitter and, uh, you know, and, and on the charts. But the reality is there's so much stuff going on underneath the liquidity cycle. You know, when I built the, 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 the 42 macro uh, sort of the, the our liquidity, you know, liquidity measure, it wasn't to Occam's razor liquidity. It was really just to explain a lot of what's happened in financial markets vis-a-vis -vis quantitative tightening and, and the fact that quantitative tightening had not begun. This is going back to Q1 of, 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 of 2022. Um, the reality is there's a lot more going on underneath the hood as it relates to liquidity. So I'll start by saying focusing narrowly on the public sector side of the equation is a no-no, in my opinion. It's mm -hmm. going to become increasingly a no-no over the coming quarters because it's very likely that we're going to have deflation, continued deflation in private sector liquidity. So I think you need to separate liquidity 
uh, in two, into two broader buckets. Well, obviously, public sector liquidity. You can look at 42 macro net liquidity. You can look at that adjusted measure of net liquidity where you subtract out the emergency uh, lending programs. Again, there's about $345 billion total as of, um, as of the most recent print from net liquidity to get a general sense of what's going on from the public sector balance sheet side. But with respect to the private sector balance sheet, that's where a lot of the problems are, and that's where the, a lot of the problems are going to continue to um, to, con to, uh, to continue to, to, to bring up. I'll start by saying, if you look at narrow money growth in the U.S. economy, it is now contracting at minus 5.8% on a year-over-year -year basis. That's the sharpest contraction we have ever seen in, net mon in narrow money growth in the history of the U.S. economy. Obviously, it's trending lower. You look at world uh, narrow money growth on a PPP, purchasing power parity weighted basis, it is now contracting just shy of 1% on a year-over-year -year basis. This is the first contraction we've seen in the time series, including 2008. So that's mm. concerning, in my opinion. And then obviously you have uh, real interest rates continuing to trend higher. Uh, looks like they might be topping out. Uh, but again, real interest rates are still very elevated relative to where they have been in, in recent cycles. And then lastly, you have you know one of the things we look at is, is sort of refinancing risk, which is the spread between the yields on you know corporate debt instruments relative to the coupons on corporate debt instruments, and then you divide that by the duration of those instruments, and we are at levels that we haven't seen since 2008. And so if you roll all those things into one broader ball, you understand that, hey, look, this emergency lending that the Fed is doing right now in order to help banks raise cash buffers in anticipation of tough times ahead and in order to support uh, the deposit outflows, this is not good. This is not the good kind of liquidity. It's not the kind of liquidity that creates the bank deposits that you know hypothecate themselves through the through the financial system in the form of rising stock prices, rising asset values, et cetera. This is the kind of liquidity provision from the Fed that is usually a harbinger of tougher times ahead, both in the financial markets and the real economy. Yeah. Okay. So I've got two questions for you on, on BTFP specifically. What would you say if I said, well, look, hey, Darius, I hear you. This is a, a lifeline to banks, right? This is hardly the type of stimulative liquidity that we saw in 2020, 2021. The other thing I might say, though, is there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. And, you know, part of, you know, what I know you look at at 4G Macro is the reverse repo facility, which was intended to be a temporary facility at one period of time. So while right now it might not be something that's stimulative, like what's to say down the line, the Fed says, hey, you know, look, there's going to, there is continuing strain in the banking sector. And we really don't want to give banks a reason not to buy bonds or uh, MBS. So we're going to keep this facility permanently. What do you what would you if you had to handicap the odds, what would what would that kind of look like? You and I, you and I are very much uh two two students of the same school of thought mm -hmm. with respect to government programs and government bailouts. Like <laughs> once you give the public sec public uh you know the general public uh free money or free lunch, you know, they're gonna cut they're gonna stay hungry and they're gonna want, <laughs> they're gonna want it. So they're gonna want it. And it's gonna and so I agree with you that where this is all headed is that program will be <laughs> by the way, I you know I, I do a lot of work on the Fed balance sheet and on you know, preparation for climate meetings. There are now like eight or nine emergency lending facilities on the fence program. Like every time yeah. we go into a new new crisis, it's like, oh yeah, we have the tools and they need a new tool and then they need a new tool for the next crisis and they keep needing new tools because obviously, you know, crises change the shape and size and, and magnitude and all the different dynamics associated. But the one thing is the, the things that are constant in crises are the same. It's fear and greed and the transition from greed to fear. And that's yeah. that's the issue. And and so going back to your to your to your question, in my opinion, yes, I agree that the bank term funding program and any other facility that they're going to introduce throughout this this this, this multi quarter pro process are going to eventually wind up as permanent residents on the Fed's balance sheet. However, the process of getting there to then becoming permanent residents requires pain, and we were talking about this in our um, you know one of our recent around the horns. That's our weekly webcast for forty two macro subscribers, where we said, look. We know where this is going to end. Rate cuts and QE and 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 you know the nationalization of all these uh, you know this this a lot of these uh, un unrealized losses etc. Nationalization some credit issues excel nationalization of bank deposits. Who knows where this ends? But we know it where it's where it's headed. But what we don't know is the path it's going to take to get there. I happen to think the path we take to get there sure. is going to require some big problems. You don't get big solutions from the government out of thin blue air. You get big solutions from the government as a response to big problems in either the real economy or financial markets or both. And so I think we're going to have to have the problems, what we've been calling the phase two credit cycle downturn, phase one being 
there's reduction in valuations associated with you know tighter monetary conditions. Phase two is the actual credit cycle, the impact of those tighter monetary conditions on the real economy and asset markets having to respond to price that in. I think the phase two credit cycle downturn is the catalyst for getting us the rate cuts, the QE, and all these you know the permanent extensions of this liquidity. It's just not going to be well. Let's just give it all away for free now with you know core PCE compounding at five percent annualized and a three and a half percent unemployment rate. Yeah, Darius, I want to make sure that we return to that point about nationalization because I think that's a very important point to hit on. But before we want to get there, I want to you know kind of bookend here, uh, just finish the questions about the liquidity cycle and then kind of move on to the credit cycle. Because to me, right, your point, so maybe uh, one way to interpret BTFP is not, hey, the Fed is, uh, you know, rolling their money printer again and and pouring stuff out and it's going to be incredibly stimulative. But does it mark an important turning point in the liquidity cycle? Maybe we could infer some things because the Fed is at the point of, hey, we need to make sure that things don't totally break. And maybe that tells us something a little bit about the the credit cycle. So is that, can we infer anything about BTFP and some of these rescue facilities rolling out? And then maybe if we could kind of segue into where we are in the credit cycle, that'd be great. Phenomenal question, Mike. Phenomenal question. And the answer is yes, I think we can infer something as it relates to the liquidity cycle, but it's not the thing that I think people are inferring. Well, mm. what, we, what we can infer is that the private sector liquidity cycle, i.e., you know, the bank deposit machine, the, the, the reapplication of credit, the, the repo market, you know, the shadow banking sector, we can infer that that liquidity cycle is headed for a deep and severe downturn. In fact, if you look at M1, you know, narrow money, it's, it's contra- like I mentioned, it's contracting at its big, sharpest drawdown ever <laughs> in the yeah. history of the time series, which goes back to 1960. So what it's effectively saying with the with the influx of, of emergency lending and all the sort of government responses we're getting from the you know uh, federal depository insurance corporation, what we're getting out of the Treasury Department in terms of uh, you know nationalizing deposits of SEB, et cetera, you know what we're getting is an inflection in the private sector liquidity cycle that is probably going to get a lot more deflationary before it ultimately starts to reflate again as a response to the public sector money reflation. Right? We have private sector money deflation that will lead the public sector money reflation that we all expect and want and will you know happily invest in as as bitcoiners as as you know as crypto enthusiasts as you know general investors in in broader risk markets but mm-hmm. i think the the interpretation which is what i see today on on twitter and, and elsewhere uh, from you know from investors who may be less informed on some of these dynamics which is well it's step 1 and now there's going to be a step 2 <laughs> and a step 3 and they don't realize yeah. that you know, when you climb a mountain, and I know this from my one experience of climbing mountains, when you get to the top, all the other mountains look really close, you know, like, because, you know, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. just optically, you know, the shape of the earth or whatever, like you, like you can throw a rock to a mountain that's like 30 miles away. Well, that's the problem with being a, you know, up here in asset market pricing terms, which is, well, we've climbed the mountain where the Fed actually acknowledged the public sector money deflation is now make, uh, extending emergency lending facilities to deal with it. And so now we think we can throw a rock to step two, which is rate cuts and QE. Well, that mountain, that rate cut and QE mountain is, is 30 miles away. You got to climb back down into the valley of despair of phase two of public se- private sector, more private sector money deflation, actual you know negative events occurring in the real economy before we actually get to the top of the next mountains, which is step two, which is the rate cuts and QE. Yeah. So Darius, take us into that valley, right? Like, so we're, we're kind of standing up here and we, we got our indication from uh, the liquidity cycle and BTFP and what we all see out there, we want to skip to skip to the end, right? The QE and risk assets inflating again and all that kind of stuff. But what you were just alluding to is, hey, there's this whole painful valley and we're going to need to go down the mountain. Our quads are going to be burning and we need to, you know, hike our way back up. I've exhausted my, my metaphors for climbing mountains because I also have limited <laughs> experience. <laughs> but you know, take us through like what does that what does that journey down there look like? Brilliant question, man. So so in our opinion, so let's just let's just rewind the tapes a little bit and, and and talk about this in layman terms. One, we know that the Fed has been tightening monetary policy for a considerable amount of time. Uh, two, we know monetary policy works with quote unquote long and variable lags, and those lags are long and variable. I've done a tremendous amount of quantitative uh, statistics on this stuff. It's they are long and variable. They sound as as, as creepy as it, as creepy as it sounds. That's supported by uh, actual statistics, and we know that we still have an inflation problem in the U.S. If you look at on mm-hmm. um, the most recent report, uh, uh, median CPI is still compounding at seven point five percent through month annualized. We're going to get core PC tomorrow. We're recording this on 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 two Thursday, March thirtieth. We'll get core PC tomorrow. Uh, 
The previous report was compounding at 4.7 through month annualized. I happen to think it's probably likely to nudge up again um, based on the leading indicators. So we know, and we also still have a generational, roughly a 50 year low in the unemployment rate. Now, I'm not one of these, you know, for lack of a better word, uninformed investors that thinks a low unemployment rate is a sign of a thriving economy. What that tells me is a sign of an economy that's very much in late cycle and could turn in any moment. Um, mm-hmm. And ultimately, but, you know, but in the absence of that turn, we have to remember that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Department, Congress especially, are reactive government agencies that only throw big solutions at big problems. They don't throw big solutions at but way above trend uh, inflation, they don't throw big solutions at elevated uh, or sorry, uh, elevated employment, you know, very depressed uh, unemployment rates. And so in terms of climbing down that mountain, what that's going to look like is those long and variable lags of monetary policy catching up. And I would argue SVB was kind of the tip of the iceberg of those long and variable lags. Right. You know, we, the Fed tightening. Let's just take another step back. The Fed tightened monetary policy to tighten credit conditions amongst banks so they can tighten credit conditions in the real economy. This is the whole point. <laughs> you know, right. This is why Jay Powell hiked interest rates a couple weeks ago. Right. It's the whole point. We, they don't want it to be unruly and messy, but they do want this to occur. So let's talk about how that how that process is going to occur. Right. We know that small bank deposit outflows, and by the way, small banks deposits account for roughly around thirty percent of total bank deposits. Not sorry, their liquid deposits, not not their time savings deposits. Their liquid deposits are exactly 28% of total deposits, and they're drawing down at around 6% from peak to trough or peak to present. And that's the sharpest drawdown by a country mile in the history of small bank liquid deposits. So not only are they going to have to raise cash to meet those deposit outflows, either through emergency lending or raising uh, equity or debt in, in, in capital markets, which I'm sure they're very loath to do <laughs> at these prices. Um, mm-hmm. What we do know is that the asset side of their balance sheet has to shrink commensurately. Right. You know, otherwise they're going to be insolvent. And so what they're likely to do is incrementally pull back on credit. And that's exactly what we're seeing. If you look at small bank loans and leases of which there are, you know, residential real estate loans, commercial real estate loans, consumer loans, uh, commercial and industrial loans, loans to the businesses. You know, that growth rate has basically got cut in half in the last few weeks. You know, it was compounding at right around nine percent on a three month annualized basis at the beginning of March. And it's now compounding at four point six percent over the last couple of weeks. That number is going negative, in our opinion. That almost has to go negative as a result of these deposit outflows, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to see a credit crunch that emanates in the small banking sector, um, um, you know, sort of really spread throughout the real economy. And the reason that matters is small banks account for roughly 40% of the loans and leases in the real economy. They account for 67% of commercial real estate lending. It's about around, you know, 25 to 30% for consumer and, and commercial and industrial loans. So it's a meaningful segment of the U.S. economy as it relates to the broader credit machine that's backfilling and, and sort of uh, supporting uh, our, all of our economic activity. So we do know that one, the, the, the actual deposit outflows, but two, also the specter of tighter regulation. There's already talks to lower the systemically important financial institution uh, 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 threshold, which would ultimately cause them to actually you know, raise more capital and, and hold more capital against their loan books um, to, to $100 billion from $250 billion. That will, you know, obviously make force a lot of other banks to, you know, change their lending standards, their lending practice, and ultimately raise a lot more capital. So we, I think, they all know that that's coming, and if they know that that's coming, they're not going to be extending credit at the same pace ahead of that. They're actually going to be pulling back on credit, tightening credit standards, raising um, 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 spreads on loans, et cetera, et cetera. And all this stuff is reflexive because when I tighten credit for you, Mike, you're going to spend less money. And mm-hmm. the businesses you spend less money at are going to spend, you know, going to have, you know, less income. And then the banks that lend to that business are going to have, you know, going to be like, well, you're less credit worthy borrower. Now I got to tighten credit for you and it goes on and so on and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's reflexive on the way up. It's reflexive on the way down. And I think we're going to see a lot of the reflexivity, uh, you know, kind of uh, hit the tape, both in uh, reported data terms and in market terms over the next, let's call it two to three quarters. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, It is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year, we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. (laughs) Uh, So last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baidu Bhatt. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times. Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero. Just a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you'll get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10. 
because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and 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 it seems like Chair Powell, right? To your point, this was this was the stated intention, and Chair Powell did mention at the last FOMC, right, that the the credit contraction that they're seeing in banks or that they expect to see in banks, it's impossible to quantify exactly, right? But it is equivalent to something like a rate cut, and critically, this is coming in the private right. sector of the economy as opposed to the the public sector of the economy. Now, you know, you're starting to get into this. I, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of this this crisis in the small regional banking sector. And then maybe if we could, did a whole episode on this actually yesterday, this would have come out uh, Wednesday, uh, you know, talking about commercial real estate and kind of the shadow banking sector. And I almost, we need a different word for that because I feel like I got to put my tinfoil hat on to say that. We're just talking about <laughs> non-bank lenders non-bank that have lenders. less regulation and are more comfortable taking risk, right? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, both like, how how much in trouble are these small to regional banks? Like, what's the connection? Like, especially like commercial real estate as being like the next shoe to drop, and then maybe just like a- anything else that you want to talk about on the 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 shadow banking sector as an extender of credit. Yeah, so we always have to remember, you know, credit, particularly loans and leases, are termed out, right? So, like commercial right. real estate being the next shoe to drop doesn't mean at all the shoe has to drop all at once. Right. There are going to be various pockets of the economy, various segments of the commercial real estate market. Obviously, office is the number one kind of boogeyman in the room. Um, mm-hmm. with it's low. I think it's like it's record uh, uh, unoccupancy rates uh, or the record low occupancy rates, record high unoccupancy rates already. And we haven't even seen people lose their jobs yet um, on, a, on, on a broad scale. So that's clearly going to be a big boogeyman. I think that's more of a 2024 story. In our, in our opinion, I think it's just going to take time for those loans and leases to mature and ultimately you know, kind of the higher rate regime and the lower occupancy regime, particularly again in offices, is going to be uh, starting to hit the tape. So I, I expect that to be a real big issue uh, next year in the economy. But there's other things in the economy that are going to be an issue as well as it relates to the pullback uh, in credit and in this, you know, in this in this segment of the market. I mean, let's let's be honest here. <laughs> the, the, they're they're borrowing money from the Fed on an emergency basis to raise cash. Now, just think about what it means to raise cash. So, in fact, I think if you look at the last um, the last week, we have data for. I believe it was uh, through March fifteenth. Um, they raise almost a hundred billion dollars in cash on a week over week basis. Now, that was the largest number we've seen on a nominal basis. But obviously, you know, you know, these numbers are all inflated by by um, you know by um, by the passage of time. But the reality is, even when you compare it to COVID, it's way higher than, than the highest week we saw in COVID during the middle of COVID. And what we know is that when banks start to raise cash, like think about what that actually means, right? Instead of lending to the real economy or actually, you know, uh, uh, lending out that cash in the repo market to other banks and non-bank lenders, they're actually pulling back. And so, what does that actually mean? Going, you know, going back to your question on, on shadow banking or, or non-bank lending, um, you know, they're, they're non-bank lenders in, in in the boom times. They're shadow banks in the bad times. By the way, yeah, <laughs> ask any regulator. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. And so, what's going to happen? What I believe is happening because we can already see it by a dipping of the negative spread between uh, T bill yields and their similar maturity money market rates. Those spreads have all gone quite negative. If you look at the euro dollar curve, pricing in right around two to three uh, rate cuts in the second half of 2023, which I think may become appropriate. It may not become appropriate. The Fed may, you know, sit on its hands, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. Why the Fed may choose to sit on its hands while some of this in the early innings of this of this phase two credit cycle downturn. Um, you know, while that, you know, so all these money markets are effectively sending sending us a signal that suggests, hey, look, collateral requirements are going up in the repo market and there are various repo markets. You know, I'm just using repo market as, as a catch-all term. Collateral requirements are going up. Margin requirements are probably going up. The availability mm-hmm. of collaterals is, 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 is getting, is declining, i.e. collateral scarcity is rising. And so this is the lifeblood of the non-bank lending, so it really is the lifeblood of the broader uh, U.S. economy. You know, obviously, you can, you and I can put a deposit in a bank and have the bank, you know, transform the maturity transformation into a loan. But most of the lending in the U.S. economy, precise, exactly sixty-seven percent to be exact, uh, comes from the non-bank sector, which itself finances itself exclusively in the repo market, or you know, maybe a pension fund, I guess, with uh, you know, with with cash or whatever. But that's not the that's not those aren't the big players. The big players are the hedge funds and insurance players. You know these other non-bank type lenders, credit funds, et cetera. And the reality is, all those things that I just discussed about the repo market and these small banks raising cash and pulling back. In fact, the big banks are raising cash too. We saw three hundred ninety, three hundred ninety-three billion dollars uh, increase, which again was an, uh, on par with the largest weekly increase in total commercial bank 
cash that we saw in, uh, in, in the height of the COVID pandemic. That's going to be a problem. Unless the Fed starts to, you know, basically <laughs> make, you know, like the, unless the Fed does something to change the broader level of fear amongst these very central players in the repo market and in the banking system, that level of fear, that decision to raise cash is going to have ripple effects. It's going to be reflexively causing other players in the system to raise cash. And ultimately, that's going to lead to a contraction in credit. It's going to lead to a contraction in the economy, in our opinion. Yeah. And, you know, one connection that I'd like to make, Darius, as well, because it seems like the smaller regional banks are going to be disproportionately affected as as compared to larger banks. Um, it, I, I remember reading this during COVID, but I, I had it totally wrong, like looking at where employment, how people were employed in the United States. And my thought was large companies were going to employ most of the people in the United States. But actually, it's the other no, way around. About two thirds of people are employed by small businesses. And as we know, right, JP Morgan doesn't care, right, or doesn't service particularly well, like mom and pop shops, like a lot of the banking relationships there between the majority employers in the United States, these small businesses are small to regional banks. So, you know, again, we're going out on a little bit of conjecture here. But, you know, if there is a disproportionate amount of stress, to your point, that kind of and that negative reflexivity loop of extending credit, disproportionately hits those small banks, does that, are we finally going to get the the change in unemployment that the Fed has been waiting to see and place so much emphasis on, right? Because that unemployment number, it sounds a little funny to even phrase it like this, it's been stubbornly low. You know, it's been extremely low unemployment and the Fed has basically come out and said, we, we'd like to see that number higher. So is that, re- is the regional bank stress, like, is that maybe the key link that we've been missing here? I think so. I think, I, I, I you know, we're, we we talk about it as if it's a crisis, as if it's um, you know this sort of exogenous event that's happening to an otherwise healthy economy. But the reality is, it's extremely endogenous. This is the process the Federal Reserve set out to accomplish when it started tightening monetary policy in early 2022. Did they want Silicon Valley Bank or, or Signature Bank to go belly up? No, that's not what they wanted. But it's a symptom. It's a it's a feature of the system rather than a bug of the system. Unfortunately. The, you know, you're going to always lose the tails in any um, in any tightening cycle. You're going to lose the tails. The people who've ascended the most leverage or the most poorly managed will always go bust in any economic downturn. And that's just this is that's just the name. That's part of living in a capitalist economy and a society. Um, so as it relates to the unemployment rate, you know, yes. And, and, and going back to uh, the discussion we had about small firms. So you know, if you look at the Fed senior loan officer survey, and we only have data from the survey uh, collected in, G- in January. I think the survey will be a little bit different in April, <laughs> by the way. But just looking, citing the, um, the January data, you know, 44, uh, a net 44% of banks were tightening lending standards uh, on CNI loans, commercial and industrial loans to small firms. You know, that number is higher than we experienced at the height of the 2001 recession. Um, if you look at the, uh, the net uh, percentage of respondents that are increasing spreads over their f- funding costs, you know, basically build up a capital concussion um, in the event of uh, you know uh, credit write downs, you know that number is at thirty three percent. It's on par with where we were in the two thousand one recession. And then if you look at the um, the net percentage respondents reporting slower, uh, stronger demand, it's a negative forty two. So you know that, that you know so that negative forty two is pretty much on par with what we saw uh, at the height of COVID. And so we know there is already the the seeds of a credit contraction are already being sown. You know, still obviously a lot of you know resiliency in the economy backward looking in the system. And I've argued since the summer of last year that the U.S. economy was very resilient, very resilient, very resilient. And we're now finally starting to see the thing break. And the thing that's breaking is not like Lehman Brothers or maybe not even Bear Stearns, but it's, it's, it's the, the, the credit channel to small business America vis-a-vis regional banks is now getting broken. Um, in fact, it's actually, I would argue, it's, it's starting to get broken for large firms as well. But as we know, it's, it's less important for the unemployment rate. And, and one final thought uh, while we're discussing the unemployment rate, and I mentioned earlier, the Fed might sit on its hands uh, in the early innings of the, of the phase two credit cycle downturn. In fact, I suspect they will. Uh, they'll pause, but they won't ease. They won't cut. They won't do QE, in my opinion, until the sh- poop really hits the fan. Um, and the reason I say that is because the Fed's, uh, if you look at their summary of economic projections, which you know the dot plot is included in that, they're forecasting the unemployment rate to rise from what we currently at 3.6% in February or in, in, the, in, in February, we'll get the March data next Friday. They're, going to, they're forecasting it to rise 90 basis points to 4.5%. There's never been a 90 basis point rise in the unemployment rate in the history of the time series going back to 1940s that didn't coincide with the recession. 
And so I think the Fed is implicitly targeting a mild recession, and they're only going to supply the market with unencumbered liquidity vis-a-vis QE and rate cuts if the recession turns out to be less mild than they thought, i.e. it's a moderate recession or even a severe contraction in the economy, which is why I'm so concerned about the Fed reaction function and why I don't believe we are at a durable inflection, the investable inflection in the liquidity cycle. We're at a tradable inflection. You know, going from rate hikes, rate hikes, rate hikes, as, as far as the eye can see, to quantitative and quantitative tightening to, oh, no, wait, we have to create a new program to supply emergency lending. That's a shift in the, in the dovish direction, but it's not the investable inflection in the liquidity cycle. It's a tradable inflection in the liquidity cycle, a la Bitcoin, a la NASDAQ, but it's not the investable one. And what we're trying to do is, I think that most of the people watching this program are terrible traders. In fact, I would argue 99.9% .9 of people watching this program are terrible. I would argue I'm not that good of a trader. I'm a good risk manager. I'm not a good not trader. A trader. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would say is, if you're not a great, if you're not in that 0.1% that it's a great trader, that's going to know when this tradable inflection liquidity cycle fizzles out and it's time to go the other way, then I would just sit out and wait, have some darn patience. Investing, mm. what Charlie Munger say? You know, the money's in the waiting. It's not in the buying and the selling. It's in the waiting. Have mm. some darn patience and, and get off Twitter. Or at least if you're going to be on Twitter, don't log into your investment account while you're on Twitter. Just, just learn and watch and just wait for the actual signal, the ambulance sirens that I was talking about six quarters ago. We have not seen or heard those ambulance sirens. Okay. So Darius, you know what I'm going to ask you next? What are those ambulance sirens and what is the investable point? Take us maybe now like moving from the credit cycle to like the broader business cycle and would love to get your thoughts on recession here as well. Yeah. So, uh, so I've, I've, always, I've long had the view that the economy is going to be, remain resilient for longer than the consensus thinks. And as a function of that, we're going to tighten more than the consensus thinks. Check, check on both of those. You know, when we came up with those views in July of 22, those are extremely counter consensus. They've already been realized in the data. So because of check one and check two, it's probably going to make the downturn worse. And what I have not seen amongst the consensus narrative is we got more resilient economy and the resultant amount of more tightening than I think a lot of investors would have thought, you know, six, nine months ago. But the consensus narrative around how deep and how mild the recession is likely to be hasn't really changed. In fact, I would argue we're still technically, few people are still technically debating a soft landing or a no landing. It's, it's now between soft landing and mild recession. And I think it needs to be between mild recession and moderate recession or severe recession. You know, and again, I, I think, you know, when you say words like severe recession, people's ears are going to perk up and they're going to label you a doomsday guy. I'm not really a doomsday guy whatsoever. I'm just a cycle guy, right? So in the middle of the severe recession, if we get one, I'm going to be the most bullish person on Twitter because I understand that the, where we are in the cycle. But the reality is I, I don't think the consensus understanding of how much all that extra tightening we got is going to contribute to the downturn. And I don't think we truly understand the ramifications of that. So I think it's very appropriate to think about, hey, look, let's start stress testing our portfolios for the more significant recession might look like. Because I think once we start doing that as investors, you know, you're going to start to see large institution A, large shadow bank B really start to pull back on their you know, participation in the equity market, their provision of credit in the credit market, et cetera, et cetera. And we haven't even talked about private, you know, the private markets who took a 6% <laughs> drawdown last year. <laughs> Congratulations, mm -hmm. if you can make up that accounting. <laughs> I'll see you at the golf course. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna work by the end of this process. You know? So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, I, I don't know if it's going to be worse than a mild recession, but I think the balance of probability suggests that it's probably going to be worse than a mild recession because I think we tightened way more than I think a lot of folks thought we would, um, you know, six to nine months ago. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to 
everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Yeah. And, you know, obviously no one has a crystal ball here. Um, but Darius, kind of help our, like one of the things that we talked about on our last interview together was help help listeners understand the relationship in between the recession kind of cycle and asset prices, because, you know, it's not one for one, right? If, if economic activity is going like this, there's not a perfect parallel line with asset prices either. So kind of walk us through how asset prices tend to behave around recessions. Oh, that's a phenomenal question. I've done a ton. I think I've done more work on that than anybody. And I say that with pride. So you're correct uh, to separate those two things. You have the business cycle, the growth cycle. There's all these different cycles that feed into the business mm-hmm. cycle, growth, inflation, employment, et cetera, et cetera. But you also have the market cycle. And there's a lot of cycles that feed into the market cycle, liquidity being one of them. And when you look at the relationship, so, so what we did, we did a big study last summer uh, where we looked at all of the, the major bear market, every bear market that, that we've had in the U.S. economy since Act One of the Great Depression um, that coincided, that, that started from an all-time high uh, in the S&P 500. There have been 17 of those. I want, around, I want to say around, right around nine of them have been recessionary bear markets. And when you look at recessionary bear markets, the market tends to bottom right around three months on a median basis uh, uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the bottom uh, of the growth cycle. Uh, we look at, you know, kind of the bottom in the manufacturing PMI as, as a proxy for the bottom uh, of the growth cycle in that study. Uh, but what's more important, I think, uh, in, in all different sort of, no matter how you slice and dice it, if it's a recessionary bear market, an inflationary bear market, if it's just a, you know, fit tightening bear market, there's all these different types of bear markets, right? But all of the bear markets, the, the number one thing that was the most sort of um, uniform in that, you know, that giant study that we did is the fact that bear markets tend to bottom right around or shortly after the inflection, the what I would consider to be the investable inflection uh, in the liquidity cycle. And so there are three, and to be specific, they tend to bottom on a median basis. Those 17 bear markets tend to bottom my, one month after the inflection in the liquidity cycle with their interquartile range of three months after to zero. So i.e., you know, right around, they're literally, you know, coincident with the, the inflection, i.e., you know, 2018, you know, 2020, mm. et cetera. Um, so what we know, so, you know, that, and, and by the way, in the, the, the longest lead, the hundred percentile reading is plus two, which means the market bottom two months ahead of the inflection in the liquidity cycle. And this is data going all the way back to the 1920s, you know, so like the, the markets tend to bottom right, you know, within let's call it two to three months around the, the what I consider to be the investable inflection in the liquidity cycle. And there are three types. There's the pause pivot, which we saw in, in, you know, kind of 1942, in, in January 2019, and the reason pause pivots, in my opinion, this is you know my you know analytical opinion. I get paid to analyze stuff. You know, in my opinion, I think the reason pause pivots are are you know uh, can be bullish for the markets it, it, only when they're done far enough away from recession, so that you can reflate soft landing expectations. Mm. But I don't think pausing. I think we're too close to recession, in my opinion, for the pause pivot to work. And there are varieties of reasons, a variety of reasons why I think we're too close to recession. Uh, number one, we saw the yield curve invert last fall. <laughs> By the time we get into this fall, it'll be a year, we'll be right around the kind of you know the high percentage uh, strike zone for when you know the recession is likely to occur. You know, in terms of you know we have a, a variety of other indicators. If you look at continuing claims as a percent of um, the total labor force, you look at the spread between the uh, leading index and the coincident index. You know, there's all these different indicators we use to kind of time where we are in the business cycle that say a recession should commence sometime in the second half of 2023 and the first quarter of 2024. Now, I would argue we're probably pulling that forward in the context of what could be more, um, you know, what we're observing when we talked about in terms of the bank deposit outflows and the raising of cash and the tightening of uh, repo market conditions. So that stuff could be getting pulled forward. But the reality is, is, you know, again, this Fed, in my opinion, and this is why I'm so concerned about the market, is I don't think that investable inflection and liquidity cycle, whether it be, again, a pause pivot, an actual pivot, they were hiking and then they cut. Or panic pivot, which is they were cutting kind of like 2019 and they started cutting really fast, i.e. 2020. That way I would consider that to be a panic pivot as well. Uh, they panicked in, um, in, 2000, in 1990 as well. Um, either pivot, in our opinion, in this particular cycle, none of those pivots is going to come you know, anytime soon in our opinion. Sorry, they're going to pause, but I don't think that's the investment inflection of liquidity cycle. Because again, I think it's too close to recession for the market to think about a soft landing. You know, we've already, we already can see the so- seeds of recession sown. So I don't think the soft landing is going to uh, going to fly in, in this pause. So let's take that off the table. They're going to have an actual pivot at some point, but I don't think that actual pivot to rate cuts and QE uh, 
is going to come until we're, in, you know, perhaps in, in like, let's say, inning three of the actual phase two credit cycle downturn in the actual markets, right? The markets are going to have to grab Jay Powell by the collar and say, Mr. Powell, stop and stop pausing, <laughs> stop pausing and start cutting and doing QE. And he's not going to do it with those, those unemployment rate forecasts. He's not going to do it with their growth forecast being as low as they are. He's not going to do it with their inflation forecast being as sticky as they are unless the markets grab Mr. Powell by the collar and say, let's go, bud. Come on. We need the drugs. Mm, you know, we mm. need the drugs. And I, I think that we need the drugs moment is going to happen in the second half of this year. I'm with you, Darius. And, you know, it's it's funny because in in some in very important ways, right, with the gro- with increasing prevalence of the forward guidance channel, what the Fed has essentially been doing is treating the markets like a rat in a maze feeding cocaine, right? Basically, it's a uh, you know operant conditioning or condition. That's that's what that's what's been happening, and now there's been a withdrawal of that cocaine. So you you've like over the course of the last you know sixteen or eighteen months, you've seen the market want to expect a pivot, right? Like the continuing rate hikes, right, have have increasingly been what the market is not forecasting and it's been surprise, surprise, surprise. Now I, I want to maybe draw your attention to get your get your question, get your sorry, opinion on what the two years been doing in response to the banking crisis. Because we now have a sharp divergence in between what the two year is sort of pricing in uh, versus what the Fed is saying that they're going to do. So is that, is this the the market uh, kind of Taking maybe not grabbing Powell by the by the jacket, but instead saying maybe like a firm tug on the arm, or or how should we interpret the the difference in between what the bond market uh, thinks the Fed is going to do right now versus what like we're kind of talking about here? No, you're you're absolutely right. I, I think there's a, a couple things going on, right? So let's we'll start by saying I'm I'm a I'm a firm believer that I don't think the bond market knows more than anyone else, with the exception of short-term money markets. I think the money markets, because there's no data to Mm. track, generally speaking, you kind of need to be in the network, right? You need to be in the know to understand, you know, these money market dynamics, because again, there's not a lot of data being published on a timely basis about any of this stuff. And so again, Mm. I think that is a spot where the the market, the market one, that part of the bond market knows more than all the rest of us. And it knows more than the Fed and and really broader asset markets. And so if you look at the euro dollar futures curve, we'll start there, you know, they went from basically, you know, pushing all the rate cuts into 2024 to pulling them all back into 2023. And they're pretty sticky now in terms of the second half of the year. We, we, we actually priced in a, a rate cut in, 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 in Q2, but that's now that's since been eradicated as you know the, the kind of banking, the height of the banking panic has subsided, which I think is I agree with. However, the stickiness of the expectation for rate cuts in the euro dollar market in the second half of this year is alarming and concerning, again, given what these people know that we don't know. They literally know stuff that we don't know because we don't right. have data. They don't even have data. They just have the data that th- their firms have and you know what their what their counterparties have. Um, so that that's uh, that's kind of step one. Uh, you mentioned the two year. The two year currently is I want to try to say ninety basis points below Fed funds. And so the two year, you know, the various measures of short term interest rates, Feds. You have the Fed's near term forward spread, uh, which is the three month or eighteen month forward three month T bill yield minus the current three month T bill yield. That's the min- that's south of minus one hundred basis points. The three month two year is south of minus one hundred to uh, one hundred basis points. So the market's effectively coalescing around sometime in the kind of 18 month, two year window, we're going to see 100 basis points of rate cuts. And in fact, if you look at the uh, OIS curve, overnight index swap curve, which are money market rates uh, on the Fed, uh, on the, uh, that are priced on the Fed's uh, Fed funds rate, that's pricing in a terminal floor out to two years of 3%. So the terminal, the, money, the OIS market thinks that we just seen the, 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 peak, uh, uh, the, the, the peak terminal Fed funds rate. In this rate hiking cycle, I happen to think we're probably going to get one more 25 in May because I don't think the data is going to deteriorate fast enough to make the Fed um, um, back off. And in fact, I know we're getting, no, no one knows anything about the future, including myself, but I believe we're going to get another 25 in May. In fact, we may actually get another 25 in June if, if the poop doesn't hit the fan by then. But I think by the time you get into the second half of the year, I think it'll be start to become very clear, both in data terms, if you look at our forecasting models, we have a bunch of econometric tools that we've built. Uh, to help forecast dynamics in the economy and the rate of change of deceleration, which has been only very modest if you look at leading indicators, et cetera, since, um, you know, really since we started slowing in the, in the first, in the second half of 2021, it's been very modest for the most part. That rate of change is likely to start to decelerate much faster uh, in the second half of the year, kind of starting around May, June of this year. So maybe you'll start to see data, maybe markets will start to sniff that out. Um, I don't need to make, you know, those types of precise calls, but I think I know where we're headed, you know, kind of six to nine months later.
Um, so, you know, I think your question is very warranted um, as it relates to the bond market really starting to say, hey, pal, you need to do this. And if mm. they don't, and by the way, markets delete the Fed. The Fed doesn't delete markets. Now, this is very true across every hiking and easing cycle. The market is always ahead of the Fed. And the reason why is not because, you know, the Fed is this very incompetent bunch of, you know, wonky economists sitting around and doesn't know what they're doing. It's because the Fed is not a market participant. The Fed is not speculating on the Fed. The Fed is the Fed. <laughs> the, the, the Fed yeah. is the Fed. You know, <laughs> they're looking at things that are you know relevant and tangible in the economy, like the employment situation, like the inflation data, like you know the conditions and growth, et cetera, and responding to those. You know, I, I keep saying, and I'm going to repeat myself: the Fed is a reactive government agency, just like the Treasury, just like Congress. They have to wait for stuff to hit the fan, either economically or in the financial markets, which usually lead the economic you know, poop hitting the fan, before they can do something about it. They can't just say, we're doing rate cuts in QE out of the thin blue air. I'm not, I mean, markets will probably respond positively to that, but probably only to a point. I think if we were growing like above trend in GDP, we had 5% inflation and a 50 year low on the unemployment rate, and the Fed said, no, we're about to launch a large scale asset purchase program. People are going to say, well, uh, I think markets will rally initially, but then they'll, by the end of the day, they'll be like, well, what the hell for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, what do you yeah. see that we don't see? And so at the end of the day, I think the Fed needs to see uh, so that they can be confirmed that we see so they can actually not spook and surprise markets. Yeah, Darius, it's super, super well said. And, you know, just to, to maybe sum that up, like an enormous part of how deep or shallow or short or long this recession is going to be will depend on the Fed reaction function. Now, we haven't talked too much about inflation, right? But we've still got, you know, around about a six handle on inflation. And that super core measure that we know the Fed has been extremely keyed into is not declining as much as the Fed would would, would really like, I think. So you can kind of just talk a little bit about um, kind of your cyclical expectations around what inflation is going to do. And then maybe if we could segue that into like a longer term kind of secular thoughts about inflation and where the true rate of inflation kind of ends up. Phenomenal question. Uh, before I answer the inflation question, let me go back and you, you hit uh, one nail that I thought is worth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of a hitting again, which is the recession might be deeper and longer than I think investors realize who are, I would argue, 90% of consensus in the mild recession camp, then that consensus, that camp realizes because monetary policy works with long and variable lags. Mm -hmm. They should be easing today to ensure that we have a mild recession mm -hmm. based on those long and variable lags. The fact that they're not easing today almost guarantees that the recession is unlikely to be just mild. And so mm -hmm. I want everyone to understand that. Hey, look, by the time these people ease, it's going to be too late to have a mild recession. We're going to be mm -hmm. debating moderate to severe recession at that point. And so that, that's, my, that's my concern. This is why I, I think I'm more bearish than the average bear on the medium term outlook for the markets in the economy. Because again, I think they overcooked the goose and they're probably not going to take the turkey out of the oven or the goose out of the oven quickly enough. And that, that's my issue. Uh, going back to inflation, I think uh, it's a really important point to uh, to highlight. So let's just throw some numbers, you know, kind of at the at, at the screen here. I mentioned earlier that median CPI was tracking at seven point five percent three month annualized. The most important thing that I said in that sentence was three month annualized, not seven point five percent. We all know that's a stupid number relative to the Fed's two percent inflation target. Which, by the way, we haven't heard the word average inflation target in a long time, right? Because mm -hmm. the Fed didn't want to unanchor on inflation expectations. It's mm -hmm. not. It's no longer an average inflation target. They want two. They, they want need two. to get it back to two to, to to quote unquote more, not unmoor, which is Bullard said. But they want to moor inflation expectations back to two. So I don't think they're going to get to three and stop. I, I think they're going to get. They want to see two, and they want to believe that two is the new floor. Two is the new mean. And we'll talk about the second half of your question, which is why I don't think two is the new mean. But uh, that's so. That's seven point five percent median CPI. We have uh, six point two percent trim mean CPI, which is effectively median CPI if you lop off. The eight percentile tails on both ends of the time series. Still, it's six point two percent. You know, if you get rid of all that, you know, median PCE, which is tends to be PCE tends to roll around about fifty basis points lower than headline, uh, lower than inflation. Median PCE is at five point three percent three month annualized. Trim mean is at four point seven percent three month annualized, and then core PCE again, which we'll get that statistic uh, tomorrow. The February data was four point seven percent three month annualized. This, oh, and then go back to the, um, the the super core measure of inflation. That's at 4.8% uh, three month annualized. So, um, oh, sorry, 5.2%. My apologies. Super core that the Fed has been citing at 5.2% three month annualized. All of these numbers 
are multiples of the Fed's 2% target. And again, these aren't year-over-year -year numbers that base effects are going to impact. These numbers are not being impacted by base effects whatsoever. You know, and this is the issue. This is the big issue is that we're still compounding at levels of inflation that are super inconsistent with the Fed's inflation mandate. So not only is unemployment too low for the Fed to be concerned enough to do rate cuts in QE, but their inflation mandate, which is a legitimate mandate, congressional mandate, they're just failing miserably on it. And as much as they have a financial stability uh, mandate, you know, imply financial stability mandate uh, vis-a-vis their third mandate. By the way, the Fed has technically three mandates. It's, it's moderate long-term interest rates, it's price stability, it's maximum inclusive employment. You know, <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously the, the moderate long-term interest rates go from the, that's how they derive their perceived financial stability mandate. But as long as the VIX isn't at 40 and regional banks aren't going out of business, they have to go, they have to and will turn their attention back to uh, what I think is the truth, what Powell has consistently communicated as their principal mandate, which is the price stability mandate. And they're failing miserably on it. And inflation is going to con you know, continue to trend lower. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded statement because the last couple of months we've seen these three month annualized rates of, of inflation that I just referenced actually accelerate. We accelerate. I think that reacceleration is is not going to be persistent. But the mere fact that we are reaccelerating at all tells us that the Fed had not done enough to kill the inflation genie. It's done enough, obviously, to start to, to, to chain, put the chain in motion to hurt the economy. And knowing what we know about business cycles, the inflation cycle relative to the growth cycle, the growth cycle leads the inflation cycle by typically, you know, one to two quarters. So they almost have to kill the economy in order to kill inflation. There is no such thing as immaculate disinflation. That has never happened in the history of the U.S. economy. In fact, if you look at, um, you know, core PCE, you know, what we did a study uh, in the summertime last year as well, kind of helping investors contextualize a lot of these, um, these dynamics in the economy. If you look at, so there have been eight recessions since the core PC time series as, as it was, was founded or introduced uh, in the late 1950s. Of those eight recessions, only one of them saw core PCE decelerating the, in the year to, into the beginning of the recession. The other seven saw core PC either either flat to up. So there is no history of immaculate deflation, disinflation or immaculate, you know, immaculate deflation or disinflation in the U.S. economy. You need to go through the actual recession to get the disinflation process going. And that's that's you know that in our opinion is another reason why the Fed might be uh, sitting on its hands. I think the Jay Powell Fed is more reactive to markets than to the economy. And ultimately, if the markets grab them by the collar and do what we say, do what we think they're going to do, they will pivot and give us rate cuts in QE. But you know, sitting on this mountain right here, this emergency lending facility mountain, trying to throw that stone, it's going to fall in the valley. We're not going to throw a stone thirty miles. I think I think we're thirty miles away from that. Yeah, Darius, a hundred percent. And I want to I want to end on actually like maybe one unifying. Uh, market or thought that kind of I think ties together a lot of your observations around you know the liquidity cycle, credit cycle, business cycle, and that is U.S. Treasuries. So we're talking about the Fed mandate, and really they've got an explicit dual mandate, right? They've got price stability, they've got unemployment, but I would argue they have a third mandate that actually supersedes both of those, which is making sure that the market for Treasury stays liquid. Because when we saw the Fed bring out their QE bazooka back in 2020, March, 2020. March of 2020, right? There was disruptions in the treasury market. And if the treasury market stopped trading, like everything else kind of breaks underneath it. And for me, the tre treasury market is always kind of, you know, uh, united everything that we're talking about in, the, in terms of liquidity, business cycle, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I guess, like, do you, do you agree with that idea that that's a wildly important market to the Fed? And, you know, could we see liquidity kind of drain out um, as, as, you know, some of these like longer term, but maybe worrisome things, right? About like uh, foreign foreign governments and and central banks not buying treasuries as much, or just what do you think about kind of the the stability of the treasury market as it stands today? Yeah, great question. So I, I agree that the Fed. I think I would argue it's the the stability the, the stability of the treasury market is implicitly under the financial stability umbrella, which is you know, implicitly under their direct mandate to have moderate long term interest rates. So uh, I agree with you. You know the. Helping finance the U.S. government, making sure that we don't become Argentina is obviously <laughs> is obviously um, yeah. you know, very important to the Treasury, to the Fed. But part of the reason that they're achieving that, part of the reason that we have not seen the kind of dysfunction in the Treasury market that we saw in March of 2020 is the fact that the Fed has been hiking interest rates to, to kill the inflation genie. Right. The, the number one thing that kills the, long, the bond market is not you know, perceived illiquidity. liquidity. 
It's inflation, unbridled, unmoored inflation expectations. You know, right now we let, we have term premium. If you look at the ten year, um, it's right around negative sixty one basis points, which means there's excess demand for that slice of that tranche of the treasury curve. You know, we got up to five hundred and thirteen basis points of term premium at the height of the great inflation in the early nineteen eighties. So that tells you that the bond market is not particularly concerned about a runaway inflation scenario that would ultimately destroy the value of of, of those treasury uh, securities. Um, for the ultimate end investors, of which you know, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of international investors. Fifteen percent of, uh, of of the treasury market is international, foreign, official sector. Um, you have eighteen percent of the treasury markets, the commercial banks. Twenty three percent is uh, obviously the Fed. Those all three of those numbers I just cited have been declining, declining, declining in recent quarters. And guess what sector is rising? It's the private sector. The us, me, and you. <laughs> we we now own forty four percent of the treasury market, up from like thirty eight percent, you know, a few quarters ago. Uh, you know, I think the numbers ran around $11 trillion, up from $8 trillion a few quarters ago. So, you know, I was on uh, Real Vision in the fall of 2021, and I said, you know, the treasury market is going to, it's going to be, at the, it's like a schoolyard bully. It's at the very top of the global capital structure, and it always gets its money. And the reason for this, by the way, is the dollar is the world's reserve currency. The treasury market, particularly, at least prior to the bank term funding program, at least a shorter end out to 10 years, were, were just as good as money in the, in the financial sector, in the repo market. That was the most pristine form of collateral in this global euro dollar system of which the dollar is the reserve currency. So this, this, you know, this, this fear that we might see some severe dysfunction in the treasury market, I think is, I don't know if it's not your fear or not, but it's, it's, I think it might be a little misplaced in the context of there is no alternative to that system. Certainly not an alternative big enough that will allow everyone in the world economy to maintain their standard of living. So we got to deal with it. And so what, what happened in March of 2020 is that we saw the dollar shoot up so fast that investors actually had to sell assets to meet margin calls and collateral calls and dollar denominated uh, out, dollar denominated obligations, and so that's um, that's kind of what happened there. That could happen here, and if it did happen here, then obviously we're going to see the rate cuts in QE. But again, I think that stuff has to happen. You know, we, we we have to have big problems to get big solutions. You know, the next big solution we get out of the Treasury, out of the Fed, out of all these agencies. Are going to be big and they're going to be great and we're all going to be high fiving each other at S and P six thousand and Bitcoin one hundred thousand. It's going to be awesome, but we have to go through the problem patch first. Otherwise, we're not going to get those big solutions. Yeah, well said, Darius. Um, Darius, unfortunately, that is that is all the time that we have. But I want to make sure that if folks want to, uh, first of all, guys. You've heard Darius before on the show, on a whole bunch of other programs. I'm sure your research is absolutely top notch, and I'm sure folks know about 42 Macro. But like, just in case, what's the best way for them to subscribe or follow you, Darius, or just uh, just plug into your your ecosystem and world? Oh, I appreciate that, man. Thanks again for having me on. I love being on this program. I love what you do for Thanks. the community, man. You, you you're one of the best interviews in the world, and I, and I genuinely mean that. Um, so I uh, appreciate the plug, man. So just come check us out at 42 Macro. Uh, we bet we make all of our re reports available via samples uh, on the website. So definitely check out those samples, see what fits for you. We we deliberately make research for every sort of type of investor. You know, you got your sort of, you know, crypto investor who just wants to be kind of mildly informed on macro. You got your general mom and pop investor who just wants to have a, you know, kind of a slower moving asset allocation type approach. And then you obviously have your sophisticated hedge fund, pension fund type investors um, that need to know, you know, pretty much everything that we're talking about with respect to these cycles. And, and we help investors construct uh, systematic portfolios to, to sort of incorporate all this information. So uh, definitely come check us out, 42macro.com. Follow us on Twitter, do all that good stuff if you like what you hear. And if you don't like what you hear, you need better ears. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, Darius. This has been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again. Do it again soon. Cheers, Mike. Appreciate you, brother. Cheers, my friend.